in the last lecture we talked about point defects in crystals today we will talk about line defects and planar defects now line defects are known as dislocations you may remember that we already mentioned dislocations and their relevance to phase transitions as topological defects in the first very first lecture of this course today we will see a little more about dislocations dislocations are caused by the slipping of one portion of the crystal with respect to the other by a distance of about one atomic spacing so one portion of the crystal slips with respect to the other by a distance of the order of one atomic spacing therefore the lattice will be distorted and this distortion will be centered around a line and that's the reason why we call it a line defect we can have two types of dislocations one is edge dislocation while the other is called screw dislocation we will now consider edge dislocation which is shown in figure 39 1a and b the figure 39 1a shows a perfect crystal without a dislocation while the figure b of the same figure shows the crystal lattice in which there is an edge dislocation so you can see that in the perfect crystal lattice the atoms are regularly arranged while the lattice with an edge dislocation you have an extra half plane so you have an extra half plane because of the relative slip so this extra half plane is shown by the blue line thick line in the upper half of the crystal lattice while the bottom the line is perpendicular to the plane of the paper so the dislocation line is perpendicular to the plane of the paper so this is shown in the figure by a thick dot at the bottom between the lower and upper parts of this so you have 
uh, displacement this displacement distance is represented by what is known as the Burgess vector. Now, this Burgess vector in the case of an edge dislocation is perpendicular to the dislocation line. So, this is shown in uh, the figure 39 2 where a b figure 39 2 a b is the dislocation line while e f is the burgers vector. So, the burgers vector E f is in this figure is obviously perpendicular to the dislocation line A b. Now, this is the case with an edge dislocation. You can also have a screw dislocation in the screw dislocation the burgers vector is not perpendicular, but parallel to the dislocation line. Such a situation is used usually created by a shear stress acting on the two parts of the crystal. So, this is shown in the figure 39 3. So, you have the dislocation line and the Burgers vector E f is actually parallel to the dislocation line A B. So, there is this results in a kind of spiral dislocation forming a spiral ramp and therefore, this is known as screw dislocation. Now, in general you can have a mixed kind of situation where the dislocation is neither an edge dislocation nor a screw dislocation but a combination of these two. That is the usual situation and you can break it up into a component which is parallel and another component which is perpendicular to the dislocation. Therefore, it is a combination of a screw and an edge dislocation. Now, this Burgers vector this gives a measure of the strength of the dislocation. In order to see this, it would be nice to consider what is known as the Burger circuit. which is shown in the next figure. So, it is a closed loop drawn around the dislocation. It starts from the undistorted region and moves in steps of integral multiples of the atomic spacing and ends back in the starting point. The next figure 39 4 shows this Berger circuit and uh, in the figure 39 4 a you see a perfect lattice without a dislocation where the Berger circuit is comes back and closes whereas, in the figure b of the same you have a dislocation. So, there is a slip which has occurred and therefore, 
the Burgers Weck circuit is not closed and this is in connection with a screw dislocation and the same situation is shown in a, for an edge dislocation in 39.4 C and D. So, you can see that the circuits closes in a perfect lattice whereas, in a lattice with dislocation the circuit does not close up. an additional step of B equal to the Burgess vector has to be traversed in order that the circuit is closed. We said that the Burgess vector is a measure of the strength of the dislocation. So, we will consider dislocation energy in order to see this. What is the energy involved in creating a dislocation? So, the formation of a dislocation involves displacement of atoms. So, there is a certain strain energy associated with the formation of a dislocation. So, this strain energy, so the presence of a dislocation causes a strain in the lattice and we are talking about the energy associated with the strain. So, let us consider a cylindrical element a shell of radius r and wall thickness d r around a screw dislocation. So, suppose we talk about a displacement parallel to the dislocation line. So, that produces a shear strain. So, if the displacement is L, then this shear strain E is L by 2 pi r, where r is the radius of the cylinder. So, if the shear modulus is G, then the shear stress is just stress by strain is the modulus. So, we know the strain. So, strain times so G L by 2 pi r that is the shear stress. Now, this displacement involves work suppose I have a displacement an infinitesimal displacement. D L now that means that the work associated with this is the stress times times the area. So, that gives the force into displacement. So, the shear stress is G L by 2 pi r times the area this is if the length of the cylinder is L then it is L d r that is the area and then you have d l as the displacement. So, that would be the work done. So, if I want the total work per unit length of the cylinder is w by capital L which is g by 2 pi integral d r by r from r naught to r integral d l. d l is to be here r 0 is the radius of the dislocation core.
and r is the distance up to which strain field exists. So, evaluating this we get G I have left out uh, L G B square by 4 pi log R by R 0. So, we see that the strain energy this total work which is the a measure of the strain energy goes as the square of the Burgers vector. So, strain energy associated with this display dislocation goes as the square of the Burgers vector. So, the dislocation always therefore, tends to have the smallest Burgers vector. in order to minimize the energy. So, the free energy is minimized by having a large number of dislocations with small Burgers vector rather than uh, one dislocation with a large Burgers vector. Of course, the Burgers vector cannot be smaller than one interatomic spacing. Now, how many such dislocations are usually present? In other words, the density of the dislocation. obviously, in a perfect crystal the dislocation density is small. So, the density is defined as the number of dislocations that intersect unit area in the crystal. So, normally it is in the range of 10 to the power 2 to 10 to the power 12 per centimeter. So, if you consider semiconductors like germanium or silicon which are grown in a very pure form the dislocation density is more in the order of 10 to the power 2 dislocations per centimeter square. Whereas, if you have a highly deformed crystal this is of the order of 10 to the power 12 per centimeter square. Now, in a perfect crystal the atomic planes cannot normally slide easily across each other, but if I have an edge dislocation it facilitates an edge dislocation facilitates the slip. So, a plane of the crystal can slip over another. This slipping is possible by the movement of edge dislocation. The slip is made possible by movement of edge dislocation. As we discussed even in the lecture 1. So, the presence of an edge dislocation causes the one portion of the crystal near the dislocation to get compressed due to the extra half plane. The movement of dislocation is possible because this compressed region moves easily along the crystal. When a shear stress is applied the critical shear stress is the stress that is required in order to facilitate such a movement and this is much lower for is for a deformed crystal of a crystal 
with dislocation is much smaller than that of that for the perfect dislocation free crystal. Now, this can be understood by a simple mechanical analogy like when you have a heavy carpet spread on the ground it cannot be slid easily as a whole on the floor. But if there is a small hump in which is created in the carpet by compressing a portion as shown in the figure and then the carpet is shaken to move the hump then the hump can easily be moved along the length of the carpet when the hump reaches the end the carpet would have slid a small distance that is shown in the next figure. The hump is the analog of the extra half plane in the edge dislocation. So, this half plane moves easily and thus the dislocation moves in the crystal. They move along crystallographic specific crystallographic planes. These crystallographic planes along which they move are known as the slip planes. So, the movement is not along any arbitrary direction usually these slip planes are planes of highest atomic packing. So, the atomic density is highest. So, the direction of the slip is the direction of the highest uh, atomic packing. For example, if you have an FCC metal then the possible slip planes are 1 1 1. and the slip direction is 1 1 0. So, the Burgers vectors corresponding to this are shown like A 1 1 0 or A by 2 1 1 1 etcetera. Now, the Burgers vector is the shortest lattice translation vector in the direction of the slip. This is because the energy as we discussed of formation of the dislocation is proportional to B square. So, if you have a BCC lattice if there is a Burgers vector equal to A. that is so in the direction in the slip direction 1 0 0 then it will split into two dislocations of each of Burgers vector this will split into two Burgers vector. of magnitude a by 2 in the direction 1 1 1. This is because b square for 1 1 0 a 1 1 0 is greater than twice b square for a by 2 1 1 1. For example, a square into 1 square plus 1 square plus 0 square that will be 2 a square whereas, in the other case it will be a by 2 square into 1 square plus 1 square plus 1 square which is 3 into a square by 4. So, this is even though there are
Now, there are 2 such. So, this will be 3 a square by 2, whereas this is 2 a square. So, this is 1.5 a square. So, splitting of this Burgers vector into 2 along 1 1 1 gives a lower energy than this. So, in the table 39 1 we are given the possible slip plane and the slip direction along with the Burgess vector for different crystal structures like the simple cubic, face centered cubic, body centered cubic and HCP hexagonal close packing. Now, dislocations have a very important bearing on the mechanical properties. If dislocations are present, the crystal is mechanically weak. So, the strength of materials can be increased by removing all dislocations and making the crystal nearly a perfect crystal. Usually, this is extremely difficult toughening make hardening or toughening a crystal by removal of dislocations. is usually an extremely difficult thing to achieve and uh, except in what are known as whiskers. So, these are hair like crystals. So, another more practical method is to impede this is removal. The second is impeding the motion of dislocations. For example, in metallic alloys, the movement of dislocations is in impeded when you have a mechanical block by introducing tiny particles of a second phase. Introduce tiny particles of a second phase. in a metallic alloy that is a possible way of doing this. For example, iron carbide particles are precipitated into iron. to make the iron tough. To strengthen aluminum for example, you have Al 2 C u. This is the phase which is put into aluminum. So, these are some typical situations in which the motion of the dislocations is impeded by the introduction of the second phase. Yet another method is to pin the dislocations so this is another method by solute atoms.
the solubility of a foreign atom will be greater in the vicinity of a dislocation than elsewhere. Therefore, the solute atoms tend to get collected near each dislocation during cooling. So, this increases the energy required for moving the dislocation thus preventing their movement. So, that is called the pinning. So, this strengthens the alloy. Then you can also increase the dislocation density. You can introduce more dislocations. If the dislocation density is large, then the dislocations get entangled and thereby are prevented from moving. So, this will be the dislocation movement will be more difficult across a spin slip plane when there are many dislocations. So, in order to do this you do what is known as work hardening. Next we go on to planar defects. The planar defects are really surface imperfections. they can be of different kinds. Now, these again have thicknesses of a few atomic uh, diameters. So, one, uh, one typical class of these planar defects is known as grain boundaries. Any actual crystal will cons consist of polycrystalline material. So, it has many crystallites. So, these are also known as grains. So, inside the crystallite they are perfect crystals and they are all the crystallites are oriented randomly with respect to one another. Then the next figure shows a low angle tilt boundary a tip type of low angle grain boundary which can be regarded as formed from a sequence of edge dislocations. So, you have a large number of edge dislocations as well as screw dislocations and in the boundary region between two adjacent grains. that is known as the grain boundary. So, the atoms are irregularly arranged. As can be seen from this figure. So, this is the relative orientation of the different grains it is usually of the order of 10 to 15 degrees the angle between the different grains. Another class of planar defects is known as stacking faults. This is because if you have hexagonal close packing or cubic close packing in FCC or HCP. If you take the different planes, the stacking is has the sequence so the stacking is different in the two cases, and if one of the planes slip or one of the planes is missing, then there is a fault. So, suppose you have an F C C and then one of them is missing for example, one of the C's 
is missing in this region this will become a HCP kind of packing because of the missing C. So, then you have a fault a stacking fault due to the difference in stacking. Then you can have also a twin boundary which is a boundary between crystals which are twins. So, you have partial displacement occurring successively on each of many neighboring atomic planes. So, this is known as twinning. So, this kind of the boundary between twinnings. How do we observe this location? One method is known as H pit. So, you take the crystal, for example, tungsten, so figure 39 H shows tungsten crystals whose surface is H with acid, and then you can see look at the dislocations. Another method is by electron micrograph. The next figure shows an a transmission electron micrograph of a titanium alloy in which the dark lines show the dislocation lines. Now, before concluding we want to talk about the theoretical critical shear stress. So, this is critical shear stress is the minimum stress in the slip direction that is capable of producing a relative motion of the atomic planes. So, this can be calculated by considering two atomic planes A and B as shown in the figure. Suppose, I consider two planes glides over plane A. So, the shear stress required for example, is a periodic function of the displacement x. So, we can write this as tau is some tau max sin 2 pi x pi a, where a is the interatomic spacing. This can be seen in the figure 3910, where the slip shows that the stress is 0 in A, the position A, while the stress is a maximum when there is a displacement of A by 4 as shown in B. Then the stress is again 0 for C, where the displacement is A by 2, and again goes to a maximum in the section D which has a which corresponds to a displacement of 3 a by 4 then again the stress becomes 0 when it becomes a. So, there is a oscillatory kind of uh, variation of the shear stress and if the separation between the two planes is d then we can calculate 
shear stress using the shear modulus. So, this will be the shear stress tau is g the shear modulus times the strain x by d. So, therefore, this will be equal to tau max sin and for small displacements we can replace the sign by therefore comparing these two we can write tau max as is g in by 2 pi into so g by 2 pi into since these are comparable for therefore we have this as g by 2 pi. So, the theoretical stress critical shear stress is just one sixth of the shear modulus which is a very large quantity, but the actual measured critical shear stresses are of the order of 10 to the power minus 4 measured values. are only about 10 to the power minus 4 g. So, there is a big difference by 4 orders of magnitude and this is because of dislocations. So, the presence of dislocation is able to explain the reason why the measured critical shear stress is 4 orders of magnitude lower than the calculated values. So, the dislocations cause a very spectacular change in the mechanical strength of a solid. So, the concept of a perfect solid fails and dislocations is the uh, really the uh, accounts for the actual observed behavior of solids. <laughs>